Some thought it might be the game of the year in the SEC Western Division. We shall see if uh, the Aggies are up to the challenge despite what they've shown us to date. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, breaking down the tide. Alabama, Texas A&M at Kyle Field on Saturday. We're bringing Stephen M. Smith of TouchdownAlabama.com to help us break it down. Steve is joining us via the phone because he has just concluded player interviews there in Tuscaloosa. Stephen, how are you doing today? Doing good, Mark. Uh, fantastic day. Starting to get a little bit of that cooler weather and uh, bringing in that uh, the, the fall atmosphere. But as you mentioned, uh, getting through some player interviews today, got a chance to speak with uh, Tua Tagovailoa, Trayvon Diggs, and while Xavier McKinney was slotted for yesterday, couldn't make Monday, so he decided to make his appearance on today as well. So, Stephen, based on what you heard from the players, what stood out to you? Well, right now, I mean, these guys focus on uh, this match with A&M, a very uh, unique kind of a hostile environment down there at Kyle Field, uh, especially on defense. Of uh, a defense has heard a lot of the noise from outside about how it's not the suffocating group that a lot of fans have become used to seeing, though that does not mean that this group is terrible, just not something that this team, that the fan base has become used to. So I believe you are about to see uh, the Alabama defense really step up and, and flex some muscle and, and try to get things done uh, on Saturday against the Aggies. Now, Stephen, we saw a similar situation last year early in the season playing overmatched opponents that the Alabama defense was giving up ground, giving up points, giving up yardage, not necessarily when it mattered, though. Specifically, I remember the Arkansas game. There were other games in which they they looked less than staunch. But then when it came down to November and the likes of Mississippi State and LSU and the better teams in the Western Division, they tightened it up. Uh, is there any thought that uh, this could be a, another situation in which because of the course of the games not being not being competitive in the second half, that uh, maybe there's not quite as much concern as there would be on the surface. I, I can see that, Mark, especially when uh, you're playing against it. And no offense to the likes of, of Duke and Ole Miss and South Carolina. You can also throw Southern Miss and New Mexico State in there. But for a lot of these players, it's difficult to get up for those games, especially when going in, you already have or people have already given you the preconceived idea that you're going to win. And when you already have that preconceived idea, there are moments where you may take a playoff here or take a playoff there or not give your maximum effort just due to you're already being told you're going to win this game. This team's no match. This team's no competition. But now that we're in this part of the schedule to where now starts the grind for the chance if you want to play for a Southeastern Conference Championship or if you want to have the opportunity to get into the college football playoff, that run starts this week against the Texas A&M team that, despite the fact that they're 3-2, and two, uh, Jimbo Fisher still brings a lot of talent to the table in terms of Kevin Mondy quarterback who can extend the play as well as make the throws needed to make on the field. You've got a core 10 of very good wide receivers, Kendr- uh, Kendrick Rogers. Courtney Davis, Jamon Osborn, and Cameron Buckley. And then defensively, you've got Justin Matabuike, among others, under the coordination of Mike Elko. So this starts to run up. If you want to play serious football, and if you want the college football playoff personnel to take you seriously, uh, it starts in this matchup right here. So I'd like to to address the Aggies and, and the talent that you speak of on both sides of the ball. But before I get to that, one more point on some of the concerns uh, in regards to Alabama running the ball, stopping the run. Uh, was there any comments made in regards to how that's going to be improved or just basically we need to tighten things up and we need to do a better job and, and focus on fundamentals and all those cliched comments? Or is there anything specific, whether that be – that the players talked about, Nick Saban talked about, or that you have seen that seems to be the obvious culprit uh, in some of these deficiencies? Well, defensively, when you look at just Nick Saban and a couple of the leaders on this team, the likes of Raekwon Davis, Anthony Jennings, of course, Xavier McKinney, the main thing is containing the quarterback. 
you know, Alabama felt like it did not do the best of jobs of containing a John Rice Plumley in the game against Ole Miss prior to the bye week and give Plumley enough credit. The young man is a legit 4-4 guy in terms of the speed and breaking containment of the pocket. So uh, keeping the quarterback contained is something that Alabama's been really uh, harping on in practice because with, with a guy like Kellen Mond, if you do not watch him, he will burn you. He will make you pay. There are some plays that he can make that will keep Texas A&M in this ball game. So, number one, defensively, uh, containing the, the quarterback offensively for Alabama is just continuing to find that balance. You know what you're going to get with Tua Tagovailoa, uh, this group of wide receivers in the passing game, but in running the football. This is the second week back that uh, Deontay Brown is playing in uh, on the field with this group of offensive linemen. Now, of course, Chris Owens, the starter at center, is questionable for this matchup against the Aggies. He too had a slight knee issue over the bye week, but it appears that Landon Dickerson, if Owens cannot go, Dickerson, the uh, former five-star and graduate transfer from uh, Florida State, who's already become kind of a fan favorite here in Tuscaloosa, you know, both got, uh, he, he's starting to get that look there at that center position. So right now, offensively, the main thing is continuing to fine-tune and create that balance in the run and pass game. Defensively, Nick Saban has talked about it. we got to have that discipline and that focus in containing the quarterback. Texas A&M has, of course, had two opportunities against top 10 teams. They went to Clemson. They contained Travis Etienne. That was their goal, but that opened up the passing game to a certain extent for Clemson. Of course, Clemson's going to get chunk yardage in the passing game against anyone. They played relatively well on defense. They were overmatched on offense. They just did not have it from play number one. Kellen Mond was off. The wide receivers, uh, as you mentioned, off the top, one of the best group. Groups in the country, I certainly thought, coming into the season, and they had an awful showing against Clemson and just didn't seem focused, could only put a touchdown on the board when it didn't matter in the final few seconds of the game. At home, where they should be energized and ready to go, especially trying to make amends for that uh, that big letdown on the national stage against Clemson, Auburn dominates them for three-plus quarters. They somewhat get back in the ball game with some late scores, but basically they were dominated up front, could not run the ball, couldn't stop the run. And, and again, so you would think Texas A&M would be mighty motivated, either, either motivated to prove that they're a much better team than what they've shown, or maybe a little bit demoralized and thinking, hey, maybe we can't stack up against the best teams, and now we've got maybe the best coming to town. It's a tough spot that Jimbo Fisher is in right now, Mark, because part of the season, everybody has this team. They played so well last year. They took Clemson down to the wire, only lost by two. You know, Kellen Mond in year one under Jimbo Fisher made so much improvement. 24 touchdown passes, nine interceptions. People thought, you know, he's finally gotten it down in terms of throwing the football to put with his rushing ability. And, though. Um, a lot of people at times undervalue the importance of how big Travion Williams was for that team last year because he was in terms of keeping that run game on the uh, on the high scale. The general consensus was you've got Jimbo Fisher, you've got Kellen Mond, you've got these receivers. The defense under Mike Elko should be much improved. This should be a team that should pull off some upset. This should be a team that should compete for an SEC West crowd. This should be a team that should be right there in the conversation when you talk college football playoff. And right now sitting at three and two, a lot of the national talking heads find themselves kind of beside themselves wondering, okay, what's happened? Because on paper, you know, this should be a team that should be running away with this thing. And the fact that it's sitting at three and two after a win against Arkansas where it kind of looked even uninspired to get that win, you kind of have to wonder what is the pulse like 
in the College Station right now. Yeah, it's a situation in which uh, Texas A&M already had a decent to very good talent. You bring in a Jimbo Fisher. He brings in a tremendous recruiting class, so he is up the standard of recruiting, and we see that going forward in the 2020 and 2021 classes. But, of course, that one recruiting class is only going to have so much impact because only a semblance of those players are going to play big roles that first year. So uh, uh, despite the hype and the optimism there, about you sign the big uh, name coach with a national championship ring and he brings in suddenly a top five recruiting class and uh, things look good. And and then the way they finish the season with wins over LSU and a route of NC State in the bowl game that you just assume that it's just going to continue from there. And it doesn't necessarily, uh, building a program and building it from a good program to an elite program isn't necessarily just one step after the other after the other after the other. Sometimes you have to take a few steps back before you can progress. So I think Jimbo Fisher certainly has the program, the program in the right direction, but maybe not necessarily this particular team is going to fall in line and take that next step from a nine win team to a 10 or 11 win team this year. And certainly they're behind the eight ball uh, as a 17 point underdog with already two losses on the season, looking at three uh, dead on against uh, Alabama. So how do you see this one playing out at this point? Well, right now, uh, when I look at the day, the Crimson Tide, they're going to come in this matchup, Mark, focused on the balance on offense, uh, set, get, continuing to get that run game jump started, also getting to a tongue of Aloha and these receivers going early and often. But one thing I want to see from the defensive side of the football, guys like Terrell Lewis, guys like Raekwon Davis, no, two guys that have top 15, top 20 top talent in terms of the NFL draft, and especially Raekwon Davis, who has not quite gotten it going yet in the sacks and tackles for loss department. He's got two, he's got, a, he's got no sacks so far through five games, no tackles for loss. What I want to see from both of these two guys is how early and often can they generate some pressure? How early and often can they affect the passing game? How early and often can they get off the football, make some things happen, and create some early energy for this defense? Those are the two guys my eyes will be on this weekend. Will be uh, uh, Raekwon Davis and Terrell Lewis in terms of can they explode off the football? Can they get to Kellen Mond? Can they rub him up? Can they affect the passing game and take the crowd out of that game early? He is Stephen M. Smith of Touchdown Alabama. Please join him, the rest of the staff there at touchdownalabama.com. You will find daily updates on Alabama football. Uh, They certainly um, cover the the rest of the, the gamut in regards to the athletics there at the University of Alabama. But, of course, football is king, and we're right in the middle of it, and you will find football coverage there like no other place. And Stephen joins us on a regular basis to break down the tie right here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. And uh, you can get my weekly uh, football predictions, college football top 25 and uh, the other relevant games. It's about 20 to 25 predictions, 13 and six against the spread last week. Just grab the link in the description section below next to voice of college football community. Stephen, you have anything else for us before we let you go? Not at this time, my man. Just uh, excited for uh, Alabama A and M this week, and uh, you know, also looking forward to this Florida MSU game. Oh yeah, big matchup, big matchup for Joe Burrow versus this Florida defense and Jonathan Grinard. And uh, you know, can Florida be able to move the ball against MSU the same way they were against Auburn? So that'll be a big matchup. Yeah, it should be fascinating since uh, Auburn was the favorite going to the Swamp. A lot of people doubted the Gators. They had not played a sharp game, but they just survived and basically beat some decent teams in Kentucky and Miami in particular. And they came out, like you said, with the defensive front just playing lights out. We're all over Bo Nix and the running game got just enough offense. And obviously the LaMichael P. Ryan 88-yard run, can they duplicate a home effort that was inspired by the swamp crowd there and go to death Valley and duplicate that as a double digit uh, underdog should be fascinating. And obviously a huge game in the sec. All right, Steven, uh, we're looking forward to another huge uh, Saturday in the sec and uh, hope you enjoy the games this weekend. No problem. Mark. I appreciate you having me today.